known unto God are all his works, and from eternal ages the covenant of grace existed in the mind of God. It's called the everlasting covenant, for the plan of salvation was not conceived after the fall of man, but it was that which was kept in silence through times eternal. She's referring to Paul who said that this plan of salvation was kept in silence. God knew about it, but kept it silent through times eternal. But now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God is made known unto all nations unto obedience of faith. That's Romans 16 verses 26 and 27. 27. When we go to the world, we should go and tell them that most of all that Jesus has provided a way out. We should also, we should teach them all, all that we've been hearing and blessed uh, to hear uh, every evening. Uh, we should teach them that God is the creator and ruler of all, all the world, that his judgment has come. And again, I was reminded last night, we should teach them that Babylon has fallen. Amen? And to come out. We should call people to come out of spiritual confusion. Teach them about God and his unchangeable Ten Commandments. Teach them about health. We should teach them that God has been lied about by the enemy. And that every biblical doctrine that, that God has given us is another glimpse of the beauty of the character of God. Amen? He, he does not burn people forever. He does not, he is not a wicked tyrant. And we need to share these truths with the world that is, is dying uh, for them. Teach them that giving to God in tithe and stewardship doesn't make us poor, but it does the opposite. God pours out his blessings on his people. Amen. And again, we should teach them most of all that God is a God of love and that in his love he provided a way of escape for sinful mankind, sunken in self-inflicted misery and unable to turn the tide. Adoniram Judson, we spoke about him earlier this week, and we talked about all of his sufferings. And, and uh, I, I've tried to give you an unvarnished picture of what it is to be a pioneer missionary. And maybe, um, maybe it seemed a little bit hard, but listen to what Judson says. In spite of sorrow, loss, and pain, our course be onward still. We sow on Burma's barren plain. We reap on Zion's hill. Amen? That didn't sound like a discouraged, tired missionary, missionary to me, does it to you? He said later, the motto of every missionary, whether, whether preacher, printer, or schoolmaster, ought to be devoted for life. And then he said, I am not tired of my whole, uh, I'm sorry, he said, I'm not tired of my work, neither am I tired of the world. Yet when Christ calls me, I shall go with gladness. Amen? In other words, he, 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 in spite of all the sufferings and trials, and, all, and, and speaking to us, this lesson speaks to us, in spite of all the sufferings and trials of these last days, when Jesus is in the heart of the missionary, uh, those trials become nothing because he knows that Jesus will repay. And then you know the, the vision that Sister White had, uh, brothers Fitch and Stockman, they were sitting under a tree. Well, Sister White and others were sitting under a tree in, in, in heaven. Brothers Fitch and Stockman came up to them and said, what was the greatest trial you passed through in getting here? And she said, we thought and we thought and we thought. It all seemed so small, she said, compared to the glories that we're experiencing now. And she said, all I could say was heaven is cheap enough. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So as I prepare to close today, there was one missionary in the Bible that I think it would do good for us to look at for just the 
last few minutes. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 28. This missionary was Jacob. God had promised his grandfather that in him or through him all the nations of the world would be blessed. Of course, we know that that's the Messiah, Jesus, Jesus Christ. And Jacob was part of that plan from his birth, but boy, did he mess it up. This was God's chosen missionary, and he had, it appeared that he'd ruined God's plan. Now he's on the run. He had, he'd, he'd turned God's plan upside down. And, and he thought when he laid down, he was tired. He was told, told in Patriarchs and Prophets, he was avoiding people. He was running. He didn't know what to do. And he got as far as he could that night, and he was out in the wilderness avoiding wild animals, but he'd rather see wild animals than people because he didn't want word to get back to his brother who wanted to kill him. And the thought that was that was was weighing upon him was that his sin had cut him off forever from God, God's chosen missionary. And it was so bad that what he used for a pillow was a rock, a stone. And the Lord who follows his wayward servants with continued calls to mercy gives him a dream. This beautiful vision where the where this great ladder extending from heaven to earth, God standing above the ladder, and let's look at verses, start at uh, verse 13, uh, chapter 28, Genesis chapter 28, verse 13, and behold, the Lord God stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south. And look, God repeats the promise that he gave to Abraham, to Jacob. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Then God goes further. He says, behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. And will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. I will not let you go, Jacob, till I have accomplished the promise that I've given you. You stay submitted. I will sanctify you and make you a fit vessel for doing my work. So Jacob wakes up and he says, The Lord was in this place. God was following me. God was with me, and I didn't know it. Friends, this morning, whatever may be your circumstances, whatever may be your self-inflicted wound, God still offers to you his plan. Amen? Amen. And he says, I can still use you. And so Jacob... uh, surrenders to the Lord, he, he makes a covenant with God, and he said, if you will bring me back to this land, that's just a, a, a construction, it doesn't mean if, as if he was doubting God, since you will bring me back to this land, God, I will give you a tenth of all that I possess, and you will be my God forever. And we know, was that, was that the end or the beginning for Jacob? That's right. Jacob was, Abraham's God, Isaac's God had now become Jacob's God. He was beginning his walk. Was Jacob a finished product? No. He was justified. Now God was beginning to work on his character. And for 21 years, Jacob suffered at the hands of his uncle. He he had an unhappy home life. The bickering between wives, uh, we have lived for, lived for 10 years in a, a country where people practice polygamy. There is no happy polygamous family. There may be the facade of it, but the, there's often fighting and jealousy between the children. 
The, the brothers and sisters, half-brothers and half-sisters, do not trust each other. And there's, there's often competition between the mothers. And Jacob lived all of this. Jacob was fooled by his uncle how many times? Well, first with Leah, and then later on he said, in fact, let's turn to Genesis chapter 31. He says in verse... Seven, Jacob, talking to his wives, said, Yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times, but God did not allow him to hurt me. And he goes on to say how, how God had been with him through all those years. God, God is taking Jacob through his experiences so that Jacob can be his servant. And uh, his, his servant that is fully fitted uh, to serve him. Verse 13. Jacob, well, the, Jacob is not sure now whether, whether, to go, whether he should go back or stay. He wants to go back, but what's keeping him from going back? He's remembering that he's left a brother behind that wants to kill him. Now, this is, this is God's chosen servant. It's one of those times in life, and we've all, we've all had them, where the past and the future meet. God wants to lead us into greater service for him, but something in the past, some memory, some pain, some whatever it is, you fill in the blank, is there, like a wall. So Jacob wants to go forward, and so he wants to, he wants to go back. He knows he needs to go back, but he's scared. And look at, look at verse 13. This is beautiful. And we should draw comfort from this this morning. I am the God, God speaking to him in a dream, of Bethel. What happened at Bethel? It was right near Bethel where he had the dream and where God said, I will bring you back. So why are you doubting? Now watch this, though. I am the God of Bethel where you anointed the pillar. So now God's reminding him, remember, you made a vow to me there. I am the God of Bethel where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of the land, and return to the land of your family. There's, there's a beautiful thing happening here. Usually, 99.9% oh, .9 of the time in the Bible, God says to us, don't make promises to me. You rely on my promises. Amen? But what's God doing here? He's reminding Jacob of his promise, of the promise Jacob made. He had made a vow to God. And are there vows that we make to God that we tend to forget? What, what could those vows be, some of those vows? Foxhole, foxhole vows. Vow, vows. When we're in trouble, Lord... If you only get me out of this situation, I'll do this. Do we tend to forget those? Mm -hmm. When we were baptized, did we make vows to God? Yes, our baptism is a vow. Are we faithful to those? God takes those seriously. God reminded Jacob, you made a vow to me to be mine. I remember that. I heard you. I will carry you. I'll take you back home. So then we know that... Jacob gets the courage and he leaves. He's pursued by his uncle Laban uh, who wanted to do him harm. But the, the angel speaks to, to Laban. God speaks to Laban and says, don't put a finger on him. Don't say anything to Jacob, whether good or bad. Jacob and Laban make a covenant and Laban goes back. And then Jacob goes home and then he hears Esau's coming. Oh no. This is it. And the Bible tells us that, that Jacob in, uh, goes to, he, he divides his families up into companies and they, they send them, he sends them, he leaves his most cherished wife back and sends her last. And he's wrestling with, with God. Uh, God's trying to get us ready to be missionaries for him. He's touching things in our lives. And it's not always 
It's sometimes very painful, and we think it's an enemy, and it's God who's tr trying to get us to grow spiritually. He's sanctifying us. Amen? And so in the book, Ministry of Healing, I think it's Help in Daily Living, the section Help in Daily Living, uh, people say, if God is leading me, why am I going through all these trouble? And, and, all the, and why do I see all of these, these things happening? And why do I see all these bad spots in my character? And she says, it is because God is leading that we have these experiences. He's trying to get us ready to be his missionaries. And Jacob wrestles all night with the person he thought was his enemy. And it was really Jesus who was trying to save him. Are you wrestling, dear friend, with God? There's actually, uh, we need to wrestle with God in prayer, amen? Not to talk about prayer, not to read about prayer, but simply to pray. Pen of Inspiration says, Jacob had reached the crisis in his life, and now every other support in his life is gone, and all he can do is turn to God. He turns to God, and an en who he thinks is an enemy grabs his shoulder, and he's wrestling all night. And then in the morning, this angel, Jesus, himself touches him, and he realizes, touches him, his his hip is disjointed, and he realizes he's been wrestling with God. And his prayer is answered when in weakness he clings to Jesus. Then he's able to go and meet his brother. And if you would, if you would allow me, it, his brother represents a hard world that wants to hear nothing in this, in this sense, to hear nothing of the gospel that you share. But after Jacob has wrestled with God, his brother's heart is now prepared to receive Jacob. And Jacob is prepared, no matter what happens, to move forward and let God take care of the results. Amen. So he goes to meet his brother, and they fall weeping on each other. And Jacob returns home. Now, now let's, what a beautiful story, amen? amen. That's, that's not the end. The story goes on and on, but, but let's go to Genesis chapter 35. And let's read verse 1. And it says, Then God said to Jacob, Now Jacob's come home already. He and his brother have, have um, buried the hatchet, so to speak. They, they are living at peace. But God says to Jacob, Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go to Bethel, and dwell there, and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. You know, when God finally delivers us and makes us his servants, it's good to remember always what God has done for us in the past. Amen? And so God says to Jacob, he says, I want you to go and live, at least for a time, at Bethel, that place where you were running from me, and you didn't even know if I heard your prayers, and and I appeared to you in a vision, stay there. Stay there. Now, here's, here's a beautiful thing. Remember the promise back in Genesis chapter 28? I won't leave you, Jacob, until I finish my project for you. And my project is I'm going to bring you right back here. And so God is telling Jacob, come back to Bethel. Isn't that beautiful? Come right back here. I told you I would do it. It's been 20-some years now, 20-some at times very long years. But come live there. 
So now Jesus has promised to save his people. And he's promised to use you and me as his missionaries to do it. In the ends of the earth, or right in our neighbor next door. And God calls us. He doesn't call us in a vacuum. He calls us, calls us in our lives, our imperfect lives as they are. And he says, I can use you to reach the world. And the little thing, the little sharing that you do today with your neighbor is helping to hasten the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so then we, we talked the first day, we shared together that the true missionary is more solicitous, not of the reward, but of Jesus' presence and work in his life at present. However, there is a reward, and we are told to look for it. Amen? And so just in the last closing minutes, when mission is ended, what's it going to be like? Isaiah, the 35th chapter. And we'll just read a few verses there from Isaiah 35, 1. In heaven and the earth made new. The wilderness and the wasteland, the Bible says, shall be glad for them. And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Remember the waste places where the healing water went? The desert has become a garden. It shall blossom abundantly, verse 2, and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The excellence of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf, deaf shall be unstopped. Then, now listen to this. Look at the picture God's painting. Verse 6. Then the lame shall walk. Is that what it says? No. Do you, you see the picture? God is taking the weakness and giving a superlative. The lame will leap. And then, in, in, like a deer, it says, and the tongue of the dumb will talk. They'll sing. Do you see what God is saying? That area of greatest weakness in our sinful bodies here on earth becomes a reason of glorification, of, glo of glorifying de uh, God when he saves us. Amen? Our weakness becomes a reason why we glorify him. Verse 7, uh, oh, verse 6, the continuation. And the tongue of the dumb sing... The water shall burst forth into, in, in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Verse 8, a highway shall be there and a road, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. Praise God, he doesn't change his law. Amen? But it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. In other words, God will save even the foolish ones who have done foolish things, who have been foolish in their lives, but when surrendered to him, they are instruments in his hand who he will use to win others to him. And the last text I would like to share with you today, Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. It says, now I saw new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself, himself shall be with them and be their God. Verse 4, and God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death. Amen. No sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. That, friends, is the end of mission, the end of the story, the 
Great controversy has ended. All has been accomplished. And, and as we said at the beginning, and as you know, Patriarchs and Prophets starts with God is love. And great controversy ends with the same words, God is love. All the universe beats in harmony. And throughout the universe is seen the, the truth that God is love. So, uh, I don't know, it's been, oh, it's been, do I have to tell you how long it's been? Yeah, I won't tell you. <laughs> 25 years now, I hate to say that, it's been a long time. Uh, we, my wife and I uh, just, uh, yeah, it was just at the beginning of our marriage, so it's been about 25 years. We were um, missionaries in Thailand, and it was on the Cambodian border, uh, because the, the, the Vietnam War, which was the larger Indochina War, had continued on into the 90s, went for a long time. And in Cambodia, the, the country had broken into three factions. The Khmer Rouge, which many of you know about, the, uh, the uh, Khmer Rouge. Yeah, there was the Sihanoukis, the royal party, and then another one kind of aligned with the royal party. And then there was the, the government in, in Phnom Penh that was uh, supported by Vietnam. And the war was a mess. And there was, we were pastoring in refugee camps, and we had uh, 18 churches in eight refugee camps over um, an area along the borders of Thailand and Cambodia of thousands of, of miles. And there was one camp that had 250,000 people. It was the largest uh, Cambodian city in the world outside of Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia. And there were, we had eight churches in that camp. Now, b before the before the war, the, church, the work had gone very slowly in the country, but in the camps, many people came to Christ. Many, many thousands of people came to Christ. And it, there were good, very good times there, very good times serving. Uh, we, we lived in Thailand just off of the border and would travel into the camps every day under heavy security, you know. This was a war zone. We would go to church some Sabbath mornings bamboo churches, uh, uh, mud floors, and uh, artillery shells blowing up in the background as we're singing. Boom, 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 we're singing. And, uh, but there were also some challenge, challenging times as well. But there was one young man in one camp, Site B was the name of the camp. There were two young men, and the church asked us to, we need, we need workers for Cambodia when the, when the war eventually ends. And so we need, um, we need you to choose some guys. We're going to send them to Spicer College in India. And when the war eventually ends, they'll become uh, workers for God. So tw uh, two, two families were chosen first. The, the two young men who are faithful young men in this, in this camp, Site B, and uh, getting, <laughs> getting them passports was a real challenge, but finally got them passports from, from their faction that controlled that camp. And then getting them out of the camps, we got permission from the United Nations to get them out of the camps, but now to get them to the capital of, of Thailand, which was nine or ten hours drive away, without getting caught by the police, because if you catch people who, don't, who are refugees outside of camps, then that's a big mess. So we got a pass from the United Nations, but that pass was only good to get them out of the camp, and we had to get them to the airport. And I remember driving uh, through the countryside and the Thai police would often stand in the road and, and right in front of the cars and flag them down. And, and so there was a policeman <laughs> standing in the road and these two gentlemen are in the car with me and they were flagging cars down and, and we were next. And I said to the guys, pray, pray, please pray that we don't get stopped. If we get stopped, we're going to have a mess in our hands. You guys are going to get arrested and I'm going to get arrested and it's just going to be trouble. And so I said, I'm going to pretend as if I don't see them. Don't, I don't see the police. And so I just kept my head forward and kept driving. And praise God, he didn't stop us. Amen. He stopped the next car. And so we, we got on, and, and uh, these gentlemen uh, got 
to Spicer. They were, they were educated. And one is now a pastor in Cambodia, uh, pastoring a church, a large church. And here's the beautiful thing. He now is supplying young people as missionaries to other parts of the country that are unreached uh, for some of our other missionary projects. 